Hey guys, I know it's a little toasty in here, so uh, we're gonna try and make this panel lively, keep you guys awake. I know you can do it. Um, just gonna do very, very brief introductions and then hand it off to our exciting expert panelists. Uh, right here, uh, contestant number one is Chris Leonard. He is a, uh, a fellow here at the New America Foundation uh, and the author of The Meat Racket, which is a new book that you can buy out in the lobby, which I think he would like me to say to you. Uh, or maybe just pick up for free, I'm not sure. No, 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 you have to buy it, yeah. but it is, yeah. it's a bargain. That's right. Pay, pay right. the dollars to Chris yeah. Leonard. Uh, he was previously the national business reporter with the Associated Press. Um, he also worked for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, which is Tyson turf, I understand. So um, he's kind of been in and around this issue for a long time, um, and he's going to share some of his insights from his book. Um, and actually, why don't you go ahead and then I'll do introductions as we hit each of the next panels. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to, with my time to talk about the tournament system, which is a payment system used for poultry farmers. This is the payment system that's used for over 90% of the chicken we eat in the United States. And I think it's really emblematic of what happens when you have heavy consolidation in an industry and an open market begins to be replaced by a few companies that have tremendous market power. And the tournament to me is the logical end point of this sort of consolidation. So it's a very important thing to examine and I'd like to give you a quick overview of how it works and what it is. Reporting the meat racket, I traveled around a lot to small towns in rural America and I remember passing through this town of West Bend, Iowa where on the corner of Main Street, they had one of those signs that usually shows the time and temperature. But in this town, it showed the market price of corn and soybeans per bushel because, you know, corn is the way of life in Iowa. So when you see that price of corn and soybeans, which changes by the minute, it's a price that's determined on an open market by the push and pull of literally millions of buyers and sellers. It's akin to the share of a, a stock on the stock market. It's a transparent price everybody can see, and the process of arriving at that price is called price discovery. All these people with their information competing back and forth to determine the price of a thing, it's a critical lifeblood of a true capitalist market. So how does the price get determined on the wholesale level, on the farm level, for all the chicken we eat? It's determined through this thing called the tournament, and here's how it works. As a business reporter, I thought chicken farmers would be paid the same way corn and soybean farmers are. Uh, but they're certainly not. What these poultry integrators will do, and an integrator, by the way, is shorthand for these big companies like Tyson Foods. They will take all the farmers in a local area who delivered chickens to a slaughterhouse in a given week. Now, as background, these chicken farmers never own the actual chickens because of the way this industry is built. The company always owns the birds. It'll provide the baby chicks and the feed to a farmer who cares for the animals for about six weeks and then delivers them to the slaughterhouse. So after the birds are delivered, the company takes, you know, could be as many as 100 farmers in an area, and then it ranks them against one another. And the key, the key criteria used for this ranking is, is how fat the farmer made the birds based on the given amount of feed that the company provides. It's called the feed efficiency ratio. And then the company will rank these farmers against each other. Those in the top half will get a bonus payment, extra money. Those in the bottom half will get a deduction. They'll get financially punished for being inefficient. And this is how the tournament plays. Now, as a business reporter, something like this sort of inherently is appealing to me. It seems to encourage efficiency, hard work, uh, even innovation. But when you really dig into how the industry is structured and how it really works, a very different picture appears. First of all, the key criteria for the success in the tournament, as any chicken farmer will tell you, are the quality of the chicks that are delivered to the farm and the quality of the feed. That's your game right there. You can do work seven days a week, but that's really what's going to determine how well you do. Of course, those factors are completely out of the control of the farmer. And in this way, the tournament can often end up being more like a lottery than a bonus system or, or an incentive system because these things are out of the farmer's control and they uh, hope that the company delivers healthy birds to them. 
Another critical element of this system is that it's a zero-sum game. The winnings of the top are inherently taken from the bottom. So in this way, the system divides farmers against one another, it makes them fight each other financially for their paycheck. And another critical element of this is the intense dissymmetry of information of the players in the game. And what I mean to say by that is the company controls who competes in the tournament, the company knows more about these uh, farming operations than the actual farmer themselves. And the farmer doesn't even know a, whom they competed against. When they get their settlement sheet, they see their name and their ranking, and the rest is kept confidential. So the farmer can't compare notes with their neighbor to find out how that neighbor did better in the tournament. It is a completely opaque game, and the farmer has no recourse. The tournament settlement sheets are confidential, so if a farmer shares them, with an attorney or a neighbor, they can be sued for sharing the company's own proprietary information. In essence, I found, reporting on this, that the tournament system is a Machiavellian system that does many things. It divides and conquers rural communities, ensures farmers don't communicate with each other, and it ensures that they compete against each other for their paycheck. But at the same time, it helps shift volatility to the farm level. The company can predict its overall payments for the tournament pool, but the farmer can't. And there's also, because the system is so opaque, it is rife for abuse. If a company has a batch of sick birds, which will inevitably happen on an industrial scale system, the, the person who receives those birds will be at a disadvantage. There is massive documentary evidence, including Tyson Foods employees' own sworn testimony in court that shows managers can deliver sick birds to a farmer who might be raising problems, raising questions, trying to organize, and in that way punish them financially. And I would like to conclude by pointing out what was most fascinating to me, which is that the tournament is not the inevitable way of doing business. I visited hog farmers in Iowa who had more competition and more choice with whom they'd like to do business. They were put into a tournament system by Smithfield Foods, but thanks to some special legal technicalities in Iowa, these farmers had the ability to work with each other and bargain with the company, and they opted out of this tournament system so they'd have more predictability. The result was a system where these farmers were given financial incentives, bonuses to do well, without the financial punishments that put many poultry farmers out of business. So that's the overview of this system. And and um, in conclusion, I'd like to say I think it is the result of power rather than simple market, ex uh, market efficiencies that create the tournament, as the difference between hog farmers in Iowa and chicken farmers in Arkansas illustrates. So thank you. Next up, we have Mike Weaver. He is a, a West Virginia chicken farmer. And uh, before getting into the poultry gig full time, he, uh, he worked in uh, West Virginia Wildlife uh, Law Enforcement and also the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. He is the president and co-founder of the uh, Contract Poultry Growers Association of the Virginias. That's right. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and I thank uh, New America Foundation for, for going to this trouble. I think this is a tremendous thing that has a lot of potential to help us all, uh, especially farmers, I hope. Um, I'd like to uh, involve everybody in this room here in, in a situation, if you don't mind. Uh, let's, let's say I'm a, a poultry integrator, and uh, you're a farmer, you're currently a farmer, or you own a little piece of land where you could build some chicken houses. So I come to you and I say, I'd like you to uh, build a facility which today, uh, a standard size facility they're asking people to build is right out a million dollars. So I want you to borrow a million dollars against your home and your property and invest it in this, oper this operation to raise my chickens for me. And ex in exchange for that, I'm going to determine when you get those chickens, how many you get, what kind of feed you get, how good the, the chicks are that you raise. And like Chris mentioned earlier, uh, 90, even the industry figures show that 97% of making a good chicken is the chicks in the feed. But you're, going to, you're not going to have any control over that. And then once you do all this for me and you raise these chickens, I'm going to make you compete against everybody else who sells their chickens for the same week you do. Knowing, knowing that, that uh, half the people are going to, have, going to have money taken away from them. The other half get paid extra, yes. But, the, but half, half that money that they receive is coming from somebody who gets it taken away from them. 
Now, who in here would, would volunteer to put money, a million dollars, into that kind of an operation? Well, I, yes, I, I understand you would, and, and a lot of people do. And I'm not saying that, that uh, uh, overall uh, integrated poultry is a bad thing. It, it could be a good thing if the profits were shared with the farmers the way they should be. Um, in addition to this uh, forcing you to compete against these other farmers, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you a pay raise for at least 10 years, which I haven't had. It's been over 10 years since I've had a pay raise. Now, now think about the, how much the, the uh, inflation has increased everything. My cost for parts, re replacements, repairs in my, my chicken operation, uh, most of them have gone up at least 300% during that time without a pay increase for me. The price I pay for propane to heat my houses uh, has increased at least 200%. Uh, th this winter, is, it went up over 500% in some areas. But, uh, and I have to give uh, pilgrims who I grow for uh, credit, they get, did give us a supplement for our fuel cost increase, but it wasn't, it, it didn't cover the increase that we had in cost, but they did give us a little bit of a supplement. And we, we've gone to them and, and taken our expenses to them and said, you know, here's our insurance, here's our taxes, here's our mortgage. Um, this is the kind of money that we're laying out, and we need an increase in pay, and their response has basically been, well, sorry, we have increases in cost too. And that's it. And this year, is a, is a wonderful example because they're making more money now than they ever have. Tyson's over $700 million in profit. That's all, after they pay all the expenses and everything. $700 million. Uh, Pilgrims, same thing. Uh, I believe it was, the number was uh, $578 million profit they made this past year. But I haven't seen a dime of it. They haven't come to us and said, we're, we're going to give growers an increase. And I understand the gentleman back here that, that uh, said earlier he's, he's glad to be a grower and he does a good job. And I also see that he's sitting next to uh, Tom Super, who works for a National Chicken Council. Uh, and uh, the companies aren't, aren't stupid. You know, they, they have growers that they cultivate and growers that they see that they get the best chickens and the best feed. And, and I would do the same thing if I was them. And I'm not saying that gentleman is in that position. He may be the very best grower and does the hardest work of anybody involved in uh, his complex that he grows for. And if he is, that's wonderful, but I've been in that position too. Uh, the, the real travesty of the tournament system is we, we have no control over the inputs. If I could say, you know, if I could go to them and say, well, you, you, you brought me uh, chicks from an old breeder flock, which are known to be inferior chicks, or chicks from a real young breeder flock, which are also inferior chicks, you brought me those as flocks, so I, I would like for you to compensate me for that. And they did it. That would be fair. But they don't do it that way. If I get in for your chicks and don't make a good chicken out of it, they take money away from me, and they give it to somebody who they would like to give it to. Or in some cases, somebody who earns it. That does happen. Um, there's a lot of other issues about it, too, I'd like to discuss. But since we're talking about the tournament system, I guess I'll have to pass it on to somebody else. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Albert Four. He is the president and founder of the American Antitrust Institute after a varied career that includes uh, 12 years running his family's jewelry business and uh, uh, a stint at the Chicago School. So uh, he is going to offer us uh, some insights about um, how antitrust bears on this debate. Well, thank you. Uh, in five minutes, there's not a whole lot that I can uh, tell you about antitrust, but I think you've already gotten an idea through prior speakers of the prevalence of concentration in our industries. And it's not just uh, food industries, it's all across the board. Any place where large capital investments are needed, uh, we've got high levels of concentration, and these levels have been growing, and they've been allowed to grow by the antitrust agencies. So uh, we can expect more concentration unless something changes very dramatically. Why? What's, what is it about antitrust that's gone wrong? Because antitrust was created as a tool not just for consumers and not just for businesses but for citizens in order to have an economy that is consonant with our democracy. And that requires 
diversity and decentralization of power to a very large extent. We're losing that. Let me make a couple of comments. One is uh, we've been hearing just in the area of, of chickens how concentrated power at one level is able to manipulate competition at another level for ends that are not consistent with, with what uh, we value and, and think is important about competition. Um, I think there are a number of reasons here that I can throw out quickly uh, to explain how we get here. One is the concept of efficiency. The underlying idea for letting mergers go through, allowing concentration to increase, is that it's very efficient. We're going to question that in a, a couple of conferences in the middle of June, this 18th and 19th. What is efficiency? What do we mean by it? What do we want from it? What concepts does it incorporate? And very importantly, what values does it exclude? We know, for instance, that economies of scale and economies of scope are very important to the economy. You'd, if you ignored those, your economy would, uh, would disappear in so many ways. It uh, would not be ex uh, ex acceptable. On the other hand, there are diseconomies of too much scale. There are diseconomies of too much scope. And uh, there are all sorts of other inefficiencies that go along with the search for greater and greater efficiency. As, as Barry has been a uh, primary uh, exponent of the idea that you can eliminate redundancies to the point that you create very fragile systems. And that's particularly true in the food chain. Uh, we don't take any of that into consideration. So that's one problem is, is allowing efficiency and the search for efficiency to dominate everything. It needs to be rethought. And we need to say to ourselves and to our countrymen, how much efficiency is enough? And at what point does it become problematic? Another problem in the antitrust field is a very narrow vision that looks at specific markets. Um, it tends to ignore the systemic nature of economics, that different levels of the market, whether it's manufacturing, the middle, midstream levels of uh, production and distribution, uh, the retail level, they all interact. Uh, that was called to my attention in the Washington Post two days ago in a discussion just reporting of uh, a banana merger that's about to take place. Um, and the uh, industry expert who was quoted said this, quote, two big fruit companies have felt the downward pressure of the big retail buyers on their margins, and consolidation appears to them to be a strategy for survival. Small farmers are under pressure from all sides, and big mergers like this can only make them more nervous about the future of their livelihoods. That's a pretty quick way of saying that things are systemically related. Antitrust does a reasonably good job of stopping uh, exceptionally large horizontal mergers. It does a terrible job on vertical mergers, and it ignores completely conglomerate mergers. Um, these are limitations on what antitrust has been reshaped to, to do and not do, and it is a cause of the level of concentration that we have. Uh, I've mentioned the wrong focus by being too narrowly focused on markets. I've mentioned giving too much credit to efficiency and not thinking about the negatives that come with it. Um, I think I can't stop without mentioning uh, money. Campaign finance freedom gives too much political clout to the large economic interests. We're stymied on what to do about it because the Supreme Court has bought off on the concept of corporate personhood and carried it to an extreme that may get even more extreme if corporations 
are said now in the next uh, few months to have uh, religious uh, freedom under the First Amendment as well as the speech freedom that allows them to buy by politicians and political outcomes. So corporate personhood is another issue that we need to focus on. And, and finally, if we're going to have real food sector reform, and if antitrust is going to be part of it, we need coalitions. I remember the song in uh, Oklahoma, at least I think I remember it, which says the farmers and the uh, ranchers need to be friends. Uh, that's not so much the problem at the moment. I think the problem is that consumers and smaller producers need to be friends and need to find additional friends to co coalesce and bring the political pressure that, that might change things. But uh, my message is there's a larger interest that we have as citizens and that until as citizens we take back some control we're giving it all up to the highly concentrated industries that are going to be increasingly concentrated in the absence of some sort of, of uh, essentially a citizen revolt. Thank you. Thank you. And last up, we have Renee Bowser, who is the Assistant General Counsel for the United Food Commercial Workers. She's going to give us some insight on uh, what labor law has to say about all this. Thank you. Uh, I've been asked to briefly uh, talk about uh, the National Labor Relations Act and the law's relationship to farmers, and also uh, the relationship between workers and farmers. The NLRA um, looks to the status of the worker and his or her relationship to the operation in question to determine whether the worker is an employee. And under the M NLRA, their protections only extend to workers who qualify as employees under the law. And specifically, uh, the definition of, of employee uh, in the law is um, to exclude any individual employed as an agricultural laborer or any individual having the status of an independent contractor. And to understand what those terms mean, um, by law, Congress has directed uh, the board to look to the definition of agriculture in the Fair Labor Standards Act, or the FLSA. And the FLSA has two definitions of farming. Um, there's a primary meaning of farming, uh, which includes, uh, and, and there's also a secondary meaning of farming. And the primary meaning of farming is all of the things that uh, talk about tillage, production of uh, producing, raising animals. Um, and then the secondary meaning of farming includes any practices that um, are performed either by a farmer or um, on a farm or incident to a farming operation. So independent growers who raise animals um, and, and crops on their own farms are engaged in primary agriculture and thus are excluded from the coverage of the NLRA. Also, independent growers would also be excluded from the NLRA because the NLRA uh, doesn't cover independent contractors. So, um, and a vertically in integrated employer can have workers who are employees under the NLRA, but also um, can have workers who are excluded from the NLRA's protections because they are work they are employed in farming operations. But I'd like to expand the discussion a little bit to say that the UFCW um, can see similarities between the conditions of contract farmers and the conditions of employees who work for the big consolidated packers. Um, we believe that uh, we both have somewhat of a common enemy um, with w Walmart, because Walmart, because it's the largest retailer in the world and the largest grocery retailer, um, with greater sales than I think the combined five closest competitors, um, has huge buying power over its suppliers, and that includes the big packers. And so, um, and if food uh, producers, such as even the Tysons, the Cargills, the JBS, and Pilgrims, need to sell their products, they need to sell their products to Walmart, because I think Walmart 
um, has more than a quarter of the grocery market. Um, and it may be even higher now, because um, that was based on uh, statistics from a couple years ago. So Walmart sets, sets direct, dramatically one-sided terms under which suppliers produce and sell goods to Walmart, and they're digging further and further into the supply chain. They shift the cost to the suppliers so as to make, of course, more profits for Walmart. And in turn, the suppliers crowd um, exert downward pressure uh, on farmers and on workers. Uh, we have a situation now where we have a big packer who is trying to uh, shift the, um, the, the cost of health care way on the workers without even an upward swing in, in pay. So they're, they're, the big packers are continually trying to push down, and the farmers get it, but also the workers in those packing houses, whether beef, pork, lamb, or poultry, who are doing uh, back-breaking and the most hazardous work in the nation. So we, um, we need to change that dynamic um, for the benefit of workers and farmers. Um, we, in the labor movement, we, we want allies, and there should be issues upon which we can try to work together. Um, UFCW, uh, my union, is concerned about and working on uh, reforming the federal procurement system. And that's the system where you have federal contractors, some of the biggest are Tyson, JBS, Pilgrim's Pride, Cargill, selling to the federal government for schools and other, for military. Um, and what we want to push for is, um, and also these big contractors like Tyson, um, like Pilgrim's Pride and JBS, they're on the list of the biggest violators of, of labor law. Um, the government puts out a list and um, Tyson's on it, JBS is on it, Pilgrim's Pride is on it. Um, and so we want to push for labor standards, and that's for the violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act and OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, UFCW is pushing for, um, we want to push for labor standards in those federal contracts. And maybe there could be other standards in those federal contracts that, that the, the original producers of the of the food can get a better better deal. So those we are hoping that we can work together on a lot of these issues because um, it's unbelievable how um, we're being uh, squeezed. The workers are being squeezed, um, even though they're doing the most backbreaking work in the nation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to exercise uh, moderator's prerogative and uh, take the first question because I have the microphone. <laughs> but then we will uh, we'll open it up to questions from the crowd. Um, we're sort of we're very lucky to have a, a genuine farmer here on our on our panel, and so I, I wondered if you could um, just uh, kind of describe the decision process. Uh, why do you grow for Pilgrims? I mean, you, you certainly have. Um, laid out the reasons that it's not always a, not always a fun time uh, to do that. Um, you know, why don't you why don't you grow for Tyson's? Why don't you grow for um, you know why why don't you go totally independent? Um, could you just kind of describe how that decision is made on the on the kind of ground level? Well, plain and simple, in my case, I don't have any other choice. Pergams is the only integrator in my area, so it's either grow for them or don't grow. Uh, uh, let me say too that uh, when I first bought this poultry farm, uh, the money was fairly good. Uh, it, it was at least enough to pay my bills. But that was 13 years ago. And that's all changed in the meantime. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I said it had been over 10 years. I haven't had a pay raise since I bought that farm. You know, how many people in here, uh, we have documentation that as far back as 1975, indicating that growers made more per pound for their chicken then than we do today. Now think about that. How many older guys in here like me would like to be living on today on what you made in 1975? Wouldn't be very easy, would it? So plain and simple, I don't have any other choice. Chris, could you talk a little bit about the kind of broader answer to that question in terms of, you know, why is Pilgrims the only choice in his area? Yes, thank you. Um, to follow up on that, you know, Mr. Weaver's situation is representative of what's going on, uh, and it's very important, the points you just brought up. We saw in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s a sweeping wave of consolidation 
tear through rural America as these big poultry companies and other meat packers were allowed to merge with one another and make the industry more consolidated than it's been at any point in U.S. history. And the impacts of that have been almost exactly as you just described. The towns that I visited to report this book, farmers were lucky if they had a choice of two integrators to work with. But even when you're in a market with a choice of two, that's not a real choice. You, you would have OK Foods and Tyson Foods, but when the two competitors know that they're the only show in town, there's not you know, a vigorous need between them to entice the farmer to do business with them. And it's a real uh, barrier to competition. But I'd like to point out, one of the most fascinating studies on this, which is in the book, was done by Bill Heffernan in Louisiana. It's a longitudinal study over 40 years where, wherein he interviewed poultry farmers about their relationship with the integrator. And the results are fascinating. What you see is that over 40 years, as competition dwindles, as the firms get bigger, and as there are fewer choices for farmers, the terms of the contracts slowly become more and more disadvantageous to the farmer and more and more advantageous to the integrator, which is really just common sense in terms of business. Anybody who has bargaining power will write a contract in their own interests. And I think that that illustrates exactly what you're talking about, which is that the economics of this business are, are closely tied to the level of consolidation and co competition in the market. And we've seen that, that as that has dissipated, life has gotten harder and harder for chicken farmers. I can't tell you, you, everything you just told me resonates exactly with what I've heard from interviewing many, many people for this book. Yeah. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to add, too, that uh, along with what Chris just said, uh, it's, the, the industry has pretty much standardized it across the nation. Uh, I can I can go to a Texas chicken farmer just like me, and he makes the same amount of money I do. Now, why is that? You know, we we had people from uh, Pilgrims come up to our complex in Moorfield, West Virginia, and we laid out our information for them about what our expenses are, and they admitted to us that our fuel costs are higher there than any other complex in the nation. But they don't compensate us an extra penny for that at all. Now, how is that fair? Mr. Ford, can you talk a little bit about um, the word monopoly? Uh, I noticed you didn't use it in your remarks. Um, it is in the name of today's program, um, and in particular when we're talking about the situation which, you know, some farmers do have a choice of two companies to work for, um, and yet the terms seem so similar. What's going on there? Well, monopoly has a um, uh, specific definition in the antitrust uh, literature, but that's not the common definition. And what I think we're talking about most of the time is, is, is power. It's, uh, it's dominating a market. You may not be the only one there, which is literally what a monopolist would be, but it's dominating in such a way that you have uh, really excessive bargaining power. Now, whole, when, when antitrust was first developed and uh, microeconomics was, was, come, was becoming a science, the idea was you'd have uh, a lot of suppliers and a lot of buyers at different levels of, of the chain. And what we have today is, is not like that. We have lots of consumers, end use buyers, and we have lots of independent farmers, a dwindling number, but both of those fit the classic uh, category. But what we're faced with in reality is high levels of concentration uh, up and down everything in between. Now, monopoly uh, is, is not really the issue. The issue is, is high levels of concentration. Technically, it's oligopoly. And on the buying side, it's, it's monopsony or oligopsony, a, a few number, a few really big buyers that have tremendous power. I mean, Walmart is not a monopolist, but it has uh, the buyer power of a monopolist. And then you have to look at markets. So when you have no choice in your market because of transportation costs and things like that, uh, how long an animal can uh, survive in transportation, uh, you've got to look at narrower uh, markets. And you've got to say, what are the choices? Well, Mike doesn't have any choices. And that's, that's the essence up and down the system, whether we're talking about farms, 
or uh, anything else you want to you buy, if the consumer or the producer does not have a reasonable range of choices, the, uh, it, it's the equivalent of some sort of serfdom. And all the power has gone to the guy with uh, the big size and the clout. Uh, uh, let me just say, we've moved away from where our concerns need to be marginal cost and price to a concern about having choices. It's different from what the antitrust laws are focused on, but it's where we need to go. I'm going to take some questions from the audience, despite my desire to keep asking questions of my own. Uh, standing up in the back. Thank you. I just wanted to note, uh, Dr. Bill Heffernan is here. Uh, Chris referred to him. Uh, he is a oh, wow. Wow. Yes, Dr. Heffernan, could you stand up for a second? That, that's amazing. Uh, Dr. Heffernan is, stand up for a second? That, that's amazing. Uh, Dr. Heffernan is that's amazing. Um, everybody, please take a minute to talk to Bill Heffernan. He's the godfather of academic study of concentration in agriculture. You can't research this topic without inevitably being steered back to Dr. Heffernan, and he's been a tremendous resource for uh, research on this topic, and I'm just so glad he's here today. That's amazing. And he's a really nice guy. He laughs all the time. I feel like I need to get something to just like cool Chris down. Yeah, He's sorry. having like a little fanboy moment up here. Yeah, what can I uh, say? Dr. Heffernan, do you by any chance have a question for any of our panelists? No, you're gonna, all right. He's gonna, he's gonna rest on his research laurels. Uh, uh, Hi, Dave Lovell again to serve. First of all, I apologize for being so arrogant earlier. Um, just so much of what I'm hearing today is so contrary to what I've personally experienced for the last 22 years. Um, to, uh, to um, Mr. Leonard, yeah. the we do have uh, we do know who we compete against frequently. Not all, not everybody, but quite you know we get the sheets that show you know the the list of all the growers who we're competing against, and you know in a small community like I'm from at least, we can pick out who's who just by the numbers, and quite frequently sometimes we'll look at somebody and go ooh that's Joe over there I don't want to compete against him next time I'll lay out an extra week just so I won't have to go to head to head with him, so it's we have some control over it. Have you ever in your life gotten a tournament sheet that has anybody else's name on it besides yours? No, no, we do not get names. But like I say, and and again, I'm speaking 100% on my experience. I you know I don't know what Mr. Weaver's been through, um, or you know growers in other areas. I'm talking about 100% about me and me only. Thank um, you very much. I am not cultivated to be here. Um, I don't even think my integrator knows that I'm here. I am, you know, if anybody who knows me tell you he's not cultivated at all. Um, also, the, about the tournament system, our whole nation is built on the tournament system. It's a free enterprise system. The person who does the best job gets paid the most. The person who does the worst job gets paid the least and probably eventually goes out of business. Sir, That's I'm called sorry free to interrupt enterprise. You. Could you um, phrase your question as a question, please? I'm, I'm another one of those uh, additions to the panel. I'll be done very quickly. You're, you're a promise. bonus panelist. We definitely, uh, it's always good to have a bonus panelist. Okay. But, uh, Mr. Weaver, let's, let's I, I, don't, I, I don't know what you've been through. And I'm sorry that I have had pay raises. Um, and you, you and I have probably bo both been called away from Christmas dinner with an alarm or called out in the middle of the night like last night, which was miserable. Um, you know, I, I see where you're coming from. Um, it's just not the experience of every chicken farmer out there, and I just want to, everyone to know that that's not the case. Okay. And I'd like to make a comment to that, if you don't mind. Uh, let's actually just take another question from the audience since we're okay. almost running out of time. Ma'am? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> oh, or or so you can't stand up. Um, I will quietly identify myself as Judy Heffernan. <laughs> and I <laughs> However, I want to bring up a point that has not yet been mentioned in all of this, though I agree with a great deal of what has been said. And I guess I'll phrase it this way. Uh, it has come to my attention over a number of years working as a rural sociologist, and then for 17 years with the faith community trying to respond to issues in rural America. It is, I have finally concluded that many of the decision makers in these firms have done wonderful jobs getting their law degrees from the finest schools and their business degrees from the finest schools, but they failed Sunday school 
whether it was held in the synagogue or in the churches. And the reason I'm saying that is because some of the others have referred to it. Uh, it seems like decisions are being made with total disregard for things we might call in general creation, the church would call it creation, we would call it the environment, without regard for the, uh, for the land and the use. And so what are we doing with waste? Well, we're polluting every well in Iowa and virtually other places as well without regard for the fairness to farmers, without regard, and the faith community has been livid about the treatment of farm workers to the point where some members have left our congregations because the church has spoken up too much, um, and certainly without regard to animals. And so then, as if that isn't bad enough that people, then we are asked, because of course social safety nets are being cut, but the faith community is then act, asked to remediate what is happening in rural places. So how many little tiny churches out in the middle of nowhere have food banks because farmers are hungry or growers aren't, aren't able to keep food on the table? Now, the price of grain the last few years has changed that somewhat. But let me just give you one more example of this. The folks in Nebraska at the highest levels of government worked very hard not to get Kawasaki to build their plant in Lexington, Nebraska, but rather to get Iowa beef processors to build their plant. And the IBP sent videos to Mexico with recruiting stories about how wonderful things were in Lexington. Nebraska, well, there was no place for people to live when they got there. Absolutely no place, and by the way, IBP didn't pay them until they'd been there at least two weeks, nor did they provide them money for the boots they needed on the floor, and all of this. So what do you think happened? The faith community went together, bought a house, hammered together bunk beds uh, for, for workers. People gave old freezers, and when the lady hired to go uh, to run the place uh, called Haven House, in Lexington, Nebraska. When she went to IBP and said, I have empty freezers, I need to have food in there for, for your workers, they said, we're sorry, we, we can't certainly do that. This came to national attention because Haven House, Lexington, Nebraska, was named one of George Bush's thousand points of light. The church picked up the tab for IBP. So I, you know, this, the, the reverberations for this are numerous. And oh, by the way, we're also going mission teams into the places from which the migrants came here to remediate situations here, like some of our trade agreements. Ma'am, I'm sorry. That left them. Do you no, have a question? I, I, no, I, no question there either. Okay, last question should be a question. Does anyone have a question? A genuine question. Down in front here, yellow shirt. Take the microphone and make it short and snappy. Okay. For, for Bert Poor, I thought you were quite eloquent in explaining how principles of antitrust have been lost over the years. But uh, just a, a specific question. Would, would you also have uh, suggestions for enforcers today? For example, perhaps mergers that have been pending or what you'd like to see current enforcers do, state and federal? I'd like to see current enforcers uh, be much more aggressive in the handling of mergers. I'm very disappointed in the American Airline U.S. Air situation, uh, although uh, there is a plus hiding there, which is that the government actually looked at the whole system. They came up with a remedy that I think is not going to work, but they looked at a system for the first time. Uh, we've got all kinds of food mergers going on, U.S. Uh, Foods and Cisco ought to be stopped. Um, uh, the banana thing that I, I mentioned, uh, I don't even know about it yet, but that's another one that's going to create a dominant firm in the world on, on bananas. You've got um, Safeway and Albertson, which is further going to consolidate uh, at the supermarket level. Um, and uh, uh, you've got um, uh, well, a number of others that are uh, going on. Uh, uh, 
Food and Wild and uh, Water Watch has done a great job in uh, in bringing some of these to the public's attention and working out the uh, analysis. We're working with them on several. Uh, the point is, though, the remedies. It's very easy for government agency to say we've done something, we've brought a complaint, or we forced a remedy, but the remedies are typically allowing more and more concentration and not necessarily being effective as remedies. So uh, this, it's within the realm of possibility that the government can step up and be more aggressive and take some chances with courts that don't like these cases and are not supportive. We'll lose a lot of them. But uh, we've got to make the try. We're unfortunately out of time. So we've got uh, lunch, I think, waiting for us. We're going to have some concluding remarks. And special thanks to our guest panelists from the audience. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, just a couple of final words. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of uh, get, uh, sort of say thanks to uh, Kirsten Holtz, who was running around with the microphone and did an amazing amount of work in preparation for this. And uh, one little word about uh, Dean Gold, who was uh, on our first panel and didn't show up. I got an email from him. He's a restaurateur here in, in D.C. He's in the process of moving his restaurant from Cleveland Park to Shaw. Uh, they've been doing a bunch of uh, moving of equipment. And this morning, his wife broke her finger, so he took her to the emergency room rather than coming here. But great restaurant, and when it opens in April, go there. Um, and I just, as a last word, I just wanted to play off of something that uh, Bert said, you know, which is um, Bert put out, you know, he said that, um, you know, it's really an issue of maybe it's time for a citizen's revolt. And what that really means is using, you know, 1962, a book was published by a fellow named Milton Friedman. And he said, you know what? Don't vote with your vote. He said, vote with your foot. If you don't like something, just go buy it somewhere else. That might have worked in the market structure of 1962, but it sure does not work now. Now you better well vote with your vote because voting with your foot just ain't going to work. So anyway, uh, in, in terms of using your feet next, there's a bunch of food outside. Uh, this food is from someone named Kit Wood. She's uh, Green Plate Catering. Uh, there's a, a few uh, um, vegan sandwiches out there, and there's also some roast beef. So choose what you want. <laughs> and, and thank you all for coming.